next five weeks. We'll be focusing our time together, talking more and sharing more about that. But you want to mark on your calendars October 20th and October 27th. Those are two big dates for Project 301 as we get this thing off the ground uh, and get, get going. So we're in the middle of college football season. And thankfully, we are finally past the most boring part of college football season. You see, over the past four weeks, all of our big schools, our, our top-ranked teams, have been playing basically Bush League colleges. Okay, so they've been blowing out team after team after team. And even this week, we, we thought we might even see some of that. In fact, the number one team in the nation played a team that they should have absolutely blown out. But your North Carolina Tar Heels showed them that Mac is Brack. Still lost, but still, nonetheless, it was very, very impressive. But over, the, over these past few weeks, we've seen these like little bitty schools play these big schools that are really high power, strong uh, football programs. And you just, you almost feel sorry for these kids. You almost feel sorry for these guys and these teams. Like they're, they're up in a, against an impossible task to try to defeat and, and hold. And so we see these major blowouts, these lopsided games. Did you know? That that's always been a college a part of college football. In fact, the biggest blowout in the history of college football happened in 1916. Two teams that were playing were uh, Cumberland College, it's a Presbyterian school in Lebanon, Tennessee, and Georgia Tech. Now there was a little bit of history behind these schools. Earlier that spring, Georgia Tech and Cumberland College played in a baseball game. And Cumberland College, this small little Presbyterian school, absolutely whooped Georgia Tech. The score was 22 to nothing. But there was a lot of controversy about the game. In fact, the coach of the baseball team happened also to be the coach of the Georgia Tech football team and the Georgia Tech men's basketball team. His name was John Heisman, who the Heisman Trophy is named after. He was infuriated. There was a lot of suspicion that Cumberland College had used professional players for that game. See, nobody knew who was on their team. I mean, they were such a small college, not very big deal. So they had scheduled a game in the fall for football. And that was when John Heisman said, we're going we're gonna to get him back. But there was a problem. Right before the season started, Cumberland decided to disband their football team. But the NCAA would not allow them to do that because they'd already set their schedule. They'd already planned everything out. And so they were either going to find them for every game that they didn't have a football team at or uh, they were going to have to play. And so Cumberland allowed one of the college players, one of the college students, to put a team together. They let him coach the team. He asked all his frat buddies to be on the team. And so every weekend as they played, there would be two, 12 to 16 players show up, play both ways, and they would get demolished. So here they are. They come against Georgia Tech, and this is the time Coach Heisman is going to get them back. And the game was the record blowout in NCAA history. The score was, check this. Now remember the baseball score, 22 to nothing. The final score of the football game was 222 to nothing. <laughs> it was absolutely brutal. By the end of the first quarter, the score was 78 to nothing. By the end of the first half, it was 128 to nothing. And it was so bad that the officials in the third and fourth quarter changed the clock from 15 minutes per quarter to 12 minutes per quarter. 98% of the game was played on Cumberland's side of the field, and 64 plays for Georgia Tech were in the red zone of Cumberland. The score was just was nuts. There were 32 touchdowns, 18 extra points. Cumberland had zero passing yards and negative 42 rushing yards and 15 turnovers. It was absolutely brutal. Uh, 222, just to make a point, don't mess with Georgia Tech. In fact, they really haven't pulled off that. Just a couple of years, and this might, might, might step on some of your toes, okay? In 1918, they had another showing like this. And they were playing your North Carolina State Wolfpack. And the final score of that game was 128 to nothing. So, November 21st, the Wolfpack and Georgia Tech play again. It's your chance for redemption. Leave it on the field. Take nothing but blood on that game, okay? Insurmountable moments. 
You know, sometimes we feel like Cumberland College in life. We face these insurmountable, impossible scenarios and situations in our life where we just don't know how we're going to face this. It's too big. It's too large. It's too, too beyond us. It's just not possible for us to, to accomplish what we're supposed to do. And in fact, did you know God has a way of putting his people in circumstances and situations like that? Where you're so outweighed, so overpowered, that you cannot, and you know you cannot do it on your own. I want to be very honest with you. I think in many ways, what we're trying to do as a church and where God is leading us as a church is very similar to that. And specifically where we're at with Project 301. I mean, it doesn't necessarily seem too difficult, too hard, too complex, but it's a big ask and it's a big project. And the mission field that God has put in front of us and put around us is absolutely huge. And honestly, a church, one church to make a difference, not just for where we are, but to make a difference in this city that so desperately needs Jesus Christ. The truth is, it is impossible, insurmountable, something that we cannot do on our own. Well, thankfully, we're not alone because God has sent his people into situations like that all throughout history and all throughout the history of the church. And I want to draw your attention this morning to one in particular. We've been in the story of Nehemiah, and Nehemiah was a man that faced something that was way, way above him. He was way outmatched. The spread on what he had in front of him was way too big for him to ever cover that. There's no possible way he could do what God was pressing upon his heart to do but yet God did it. We looked in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, his, his heavy heart for what was taking place and the deep need and the big problem that there was for his homeland. We looked in the second part of chapter 1, how he, how he sought God and he asked God to do something. He asked God to move and work. He confessed sin and he did the work in private that we see throughout the rest of the book God displayed in public. And in chapter 2, Nehemiah begins positioning himself for what God's going to do. And what he realized when he came to this was that it was way bigger than he was. I'm going to read the story that we're going to look at this morning, and then I want to talk about it with you. So would you stand in honor of God's word? Nehemiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, why is, why is your face sad? Seeing that you're not sick, this is nothing but sadness of the heart. And then I was, I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why, why should not my face be sad? Um, in the city, the place of my father's graves lies in ruins. And its gates have been destroyed by fire. And then the king said to me, what are you requesting? And so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, then, then send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, how, how long are you going to be gone? And when are you going to return? And so it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, well, if it pleases the king, would you let letters be given to me, uh, to the governors of the province beyond the rivers, so that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah? And could you also provide a letter to Asaph, the, the keeper of the king's forests, and so that he may give me timber and make beams for the gates of the fortresses of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy? And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. You can be seated. What Nehemiah was facing here and the request and the situation was far bigger than where he was. Prior to chapter 2, Nehemiah tells us who he really is. He exposes himself and he shows the vulnerabilities of his life with the last sentence 
of chapter 1, where he describes himself. He says, now I was cupbearer to the king. Now, that may not mean a whole lot to us today. We don't really have cupbearers or anything like that. But basically, he was a butler in some sense. He was a little bit more than a butler. He was with the king all the time. And he would organize the events the king was in, and he would make sure that everyone was serving properly. And it was a great job, especially for a foreigner like himself. It was a job where he was a servant to the highest and most powerful man in the nation. He got to eat his food. He got to stay in his palace. He got to be very close. He, he got an inside look at all that was taking place. And, and he was a, a, a person the king would have relied upon and leaned upon. They, they had a personal relationship. You can even tell that in chapter 2 when the king notices something different in Nehemiah and calls him on it in a personal call. That would be rare, very rare for someone like King Artaxerxes to do to someone. He knew Nehemiah really well. And it was a great job. It was a great job all the way until somebody tried to poison the king because it was Nehemiah's job to make sure that what he's serving the king wasn't poisonous, so he would sample everything. And so great job until somebody hates the king and tries to poison him, and then Nehemiah is the one you find out through because he's laying dead on the floor. It was a good situation. Why would he want to leave that? Why would he want to risk that? Why would he want to risk that for people he'd never met? Why would he want to risk that for a place he'd never been to? Nehemiah's got a plush life. He's got a very comfortable life as we approach chapter 2. Yes, he's burdened. Yes, he, he's concerned about what God's concerned about. But he'd never seen the place. He had no memory of it. He had a great job. This was a little man with no leverage before the highest man in the land. Why would Nehemiah want to risk everything why would Nehemiah want to risk the situation that he was in? Why would Nehemiah want to step out and try to do something that he inevitably would fail at? That a man like him of his stature and his place and his influence and his name had no business being a part of what he was proposing to do before the king. Why would he push it? Why would he push the envelope? Why would he, he, he shake things up? Why would he try? Because Nehemiah had a vision. Nehemiah knew that God was calling him to lead. And accomplishing that vision and stepping forward meaning meant that he was going to have to leave the comforts of his norm. That he was going to have to get out of his comfort zone. We see something in Nehemiah take place here in chapter 2 that we don't see a whole lot in many believers today. Most of us limit the activity and work of God by our comfort zone. We believe God can do anything. We see the massive needs that God has in this world. We see the things that God wants to do. We feel the pressing through the Holy Spirit of God inside of us to do something about it. But most of us limit God's activity within our self-made comfort zone. You know what you call that? You call that a lack of of faith. Now, some of you in this room like to fish. And I think most of you that probably do, it's a dream of yours, it's a dream of mine to catch a massive fish. I want to catch a big fish. I want you to see me on social media holding a big stinking fish in my hand. I'll release it and put it back, but I want that picture. I want the replica that I can put on the wall so I can tell the story about the time that I caught the biggest fish in the world. Any fisherman wants to do that. Any fisherman wants to accomplish something like that. But a good fisherman doesn't do this. I want to catch a big fish. I want to do something great. I want to be able to do this. So I'm going to go home. I'm going to grab my tackle. I'm going to grab my rod. I'm going to go fill up my bathtub. I'm going to fish. Hey. God can provide a big fish in a bathtub. Can he not? Well, yes, he can. He's God. He can do anything. I got a dream to do it, so I'm just going to trust God for it. You can fish there all day and do that all day. But he's 
probably not going to do that. Why do you say that, Robert? Well, because he's never done that before. Because he doesn't necessarily bless cowards. You, you want to you catch a big fish? You know, you've got to go to a lake. You've got to go to particularly a lake that has big fish in it. And you've got to be very consistent with that. You've got to learn. You've got to grow, you got to try, you got to practice, you got to catch a bunch of small fish, you got to have a bunch of days you don't catch anything, you got to watch the TV shows, you got to read the magazines, you got to do all that stuff to get to that place and point to catch the big fish. See, so often we limit what God wants to do, the impossible, the miraculous, the incredible. Yes, he can do something through nothing. Look at the world, something out of nothing. But God works through people, and he particularly works through people who are willing to trust him at his word, who are willing to be bold, to take risks, to display faith in his power, in his calling and obedience. For God to do what he wants to do and what we see him calling us to do, we have to get out of our comfort zone. We have to be willing to break down the walls of what we've limited God in. We've got to be willing to get a little radical. We've got to be willing to get a little unsettled. We've confined God to our comfort and thus eliminated change. We don't like things to change because change changes our comfort zone. Change changes the familiar. Change changes the norm. Change changes the way that it's always been and the way that we've come to understand things and the way that we've grown up in things. God is not calling people. God is not calling you and God is not calling me and God is not calling our church to stay where we're at and to do things the way that we've always done. He's calling us to faith to trust him, to believe him, to be bold. We've settled today for a ho-hum Christianity, a mediocre faith that there are no risks, no commitment. Christianity today is a low-risk, low-commitment thing. Being part of a church in most places and for most believers is a low-risk thing and a low-commitment thing. You, you don't have to sign up. You don't have to do anything. You, you, you just come and you just go at your pace. You do what you want to do the way you want to do it. Amen. But that's not what faith is called, and that's not what faith looks like. Faith is risking Not for what you see, but for what you know. Faith is believing what God has said and believing that God will work. Faith is being willing to get out of the comfort zone and get out of the norm. The world around us is is changing. And the way things have been done in the past aren't necessarily the way they're going to be affected. Take evangelism. God's called us to evangelism. God's called us to share the gospel with people. And there was a day and time that it was much easier than it is today. Not 20, 30 years ago, the risk of you being evangelistic was, was pretty low. All you had to do was simply invite. You didn't have to know the person necessarily. We just had to put an event together, and we invite them to the church. We invite them to come to a revival. We invite them to come to a crusade. And, and in some places, and in sometimes God still blesses and works through that. But people are more difficult. They're a whole lot more skeptical, and they're a whole lot more de-churched and unchurched than they were before. So it requires more than just simply inviting. You've actually got to take a further step and get to know people and to genuinely care for people and to have conversations with them because they're not going to just come to a person's place that they don't know that hasn't invested and shown genuine care and concern for them. We've got to get deeper into people's lives. We've got to take bigger risks and get out of our comfort zone. So many today don't have that conversation, have never led a person, Lord, because they're unwilling to take the risk of getting out of their comfort zone. But what God has called you and what God has called me and what God has called his church and people to is not easy. It requires risk, faith, and commitment and risk faith and commitment have always been ingredients to God's will for our lives and for your church 
Jesus said himself, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. If you can do what God is calling you to do and change nothing, then God is not calling you to do it. It was bigger than where he was, but it was also bigger than what he could do. Nehemiah, what had to be done was massive, which is why there was such an angst in his soul, an unno- a noticeable angst. So he comes before, he's working one day with King Artaxerxes, and Artaxerxes says, whoa, time out. Boy, what's wrong with you? Well, n- n- nothing's wrong with me. No, 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 no. You look really sad, and you're not sick. And I know you're not sick, because if you were sick, you wouldn't be here. Because you know, you come around me with the flu, I'm going to cut your head off. So you wouldn't risk that. So something's wrong. There's something wrong with your soul. There's something wrong with your spirit. And Nehemiah, man, was terrified. Because all of a sudden, without his planning, without his preparation, he hid it and hid it and hid it inside his soul all these months. And now it's exposed. And now the most powerful man in the land is exposed, has has exposed it. There's something wrong. And I want to know what is wrong with you, Nehemiah. Nehemiah didn't force that situation upon himself. God did. Isn't it interesting that it just so happens that Nehemiah has the job that he had? That it just so happens God places upon Nehemiah's soul. And it just so happens that nobody else has noticed how Nehemiah is, but the most powerful man in the land that, as we see, funds the whole project that Nehemiah is about to take part in, notices. Just so happens. Let me tell you something, it never so happens. God has so many intentional things in his people. God has positioned you and put you around people so that it doesn't just so happen, but God is intentionally working to use you and God is intentionally working to put you in places where you can be used. Now look at just this church, 185 years, here we are. And it just so happens today, we have the largest lost mission field that's ever been around us. It just so happens. Now God positioned him for that. And so Nehemiah's at this moment, this time, this, is this it? Is this the moment? Nehemiah's terrified. He asks God to help him, and he begins to just spit it out. And what he spit out was a tall order. It was bold of Nehemiah. So, so tell me what the problem is, Nehemiah. Tell me what you want to do. Well, well King, um, so pretty much my homeland, I've never seen it, but my, my fathers, my forefathers are buried there Man, it's in shambles. The gates are burned. The city is ruined. And they're in deep, deep trouble. And it troubles my soul. So he was honest about that. I'm hurt. I'm sad. I'm broken over my people. And then Artaxerxes takes it, well, what do you want me to do about it? Why are you, te- why are you telling me? Let's get this either. Let's, let's just bring it on the table. Let's make a decision. What are you asking me, Nehemiah? And this is when the tall order is done. Just think of what Nehemiah had to ask the king and ask the king. So I need, I need some time off with pay. I need you to let me take a, a leave of absence and, and can I keep my job and be gone for a while and so that I can go back home and rebuild a city that in years past has posed a military threat to your nation. Can I have some time off for that? And would you be willing to pay for it all? Like fit the bill for this? Because I'm just a cupbearer. I mean, it's a nice life, but I don't have very big savings. I don't have a big 401k. I don't really have a lot of resources. So would you be willing to pay for this? Oh, oh, and before we do all this, can you, can you write me some letters? I need some letters because I'm going to be crossing through a lot of providences and they're going to want to know who I am, why I'm there and where I'm going. Basically, I got to go through a lot of passport control places and I need a valid passport and some handwritten visas from you. So would you write letters to all these governors by name and, um, and uh, let them know why I'm coming and all this kind of stuff. Oh, and on top of that, one more thing. Would it be okay if you also gave me a letter to the keeper of your forest so I can go there and I can get all the lumber and timber I want. You pay for it again. And can you also kind of help me get it to where I'm going? Like U-Haul, 18-wheeler, whatever, and, w- and take it down there. 
Oh, oh, one more thing, King. Can you give me a promotion while I'm not working for you? Can you give me the title governor of Judah? I know I didn't earn it. I know I've not gone the political route, didn't run for any office, didn't have a campaign. But would you mind just saying he's the governor of, of, of Judah so that when I go in, I've got kind of like some, some leverage with these people that I'm kind of in charge of the entire country? Would you mind doing that? So when I go into Jerusalem, I can say, hey, I'm in charge now. And then on the flip side, for what Nehemiah had to do, he had to go into a place where nobody knew him, nobody respected him, nobody knew who he was, likely didn't know his family anymore, and lead these people, convince these people to follow him, and take a group of people who clearly didn't know how to build a wall because for 140 years this wall had been falling down, and lead this people who were not warriors anymore, who were not strong, who were defeated foe, and to lead them through a lot of animosity to rebuild a wall. Way too much for a dude whose job was simply this. Here's your cup. He didn't have any experience. He didn't have any skills. He never led anything other than leading the cup from here to here and handing it to the king. This task, this job, this calling was way bigger than what Nehemiah could do. There was no way that he could have done all this stuff. He was just a cupbearer. The vision should have died right here. When Nehemiah thought of all the things that he had to do, when Nehemiah brought it before the king, it should have been squashed. He should have said, there's no way I'm doing that. There's no way I can do that. There's no way I'm able to do that. My family, my comfort, my home, my everything. There's no way he'll listen to me. You know, visions die all the time. God calls people to do something, they see the problem and the need to do it, and it doesn't get done. You know how I know this? Because churches die all the time. Every year, 6,000 to 10,000 churches shut their doors for the last time. Weekly, that's 100 to 200 churches that close their doors. In the time that I've been in Charlotte, We've already seen a number of churches in this city, some of them within a mile of where we're sitting, that are brothers and sisters in Christ that believe the same gospel as us, have shut their doors. Yet God has the same calling upon his church, the same vision for his church that he did 2,000 years ago. Why have we stopped believing that God can do great, big, impossible things. He's done it all the time through people who weren't qualified, who weren't strong, and the job was way above them. Think of Moses, 80-year-old man, lead a million people out of Egypt. He gets to the Red Sea, doesn't have a boat, has no way to get across the sea. God handles it like that. Sea parts. Think of little David, shepherd boy, anointed as king. Philistines are fighting. David goes up, never fought a battle before, has nothing but stones and a sling, and he defeats the greatest warrior of their day. Think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who stood in faith and stood for what they believed and worshiped the Lord, and they're thrown into a fire. What happens when you get thrown into a fire? You burn. Not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Think of Elijah. Elijah had to stand up and prove that his God was the one true God. And so he says, all right, let's have a game. Let's call fire down from heaven. Here's my wood. Let's throw some water on it. Let's douse this wood, make it, make it wet, as wet as can be. And God throws fire down and consumes that wood like that. And think of Jesus and the apostles doing ministry one day. Jesus says, feed these thousands of people. Whoa, <laughs> we don't have any food. We don't have any food. All we got is this kid's lunch. Okay, feed them. Within a matter of moments, thousands of people are fed to their full. Oh, oh, here's one. Friday, dead. Sunday, alive. 
Our God is no stranger to doing impossible things, to facing insurmountable tasks. Nothing is too big for him. You and I need to believe that that's the same God that we serve. You and I need to believe that that's the same God that wants to work through us to do something impossible because God knows how to do the insurmountable. God knows how to do the impossible. Nothing is impossible with him. He knows how to reach your husband, your wife, your boss, your neighbor with the gospel. He knows how to protect your children from this evil world. He knows how to get a prayer group started at your workplace. He knows how to get you moving forward in your job, business, and give you what you need in your life to provide for you. He knows how to get you through your hurt and grief and pain. He knows how to fix your marriage. Nothing is impossible to him. Don't you hold back. Don't you say, no, 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 not that. Not that. I won't do that. I can't do that. That's not going to happen. No, you believe God can because he can. Let me tell you something, church. I believe God can do incredible things through this church. I don't think it's ungodly. In fact, I think it's ungodly to not think this, that God doesn't want to fill this building multiple times throughout the weekend and week with people worshiping him. I don't think God wants to see that balcony continue to collect dust and our baptistry to regularly remain empty. I don't think God wants the people around us to spend eternity in hell. I think God wants to do something great through us. I think he can. You know, there have been people in the history of this church, this great church, 185 years, that have dreamed big with God and that have been bold and took risks. People who have trusted, committed, and sacrificed. And for many, many decades, Charlotte was changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ through the ministry of First Baptist Church. Amen. I think he wants to do it again. I don't know who it was that said this, so I can't give the correct credit. But it's been something that was said to me so long ago. Dream, dream so big that if God doesn't come through, you fall flat on your face. Amen. I think our problem is that we're dreaming dreams that we can attain that we can do and we can accomplish. It's not faith. It's cowardice. Nehemiah was so overwhelmed this that in verse 4 he had to go and say, I pray to the God of heaven, and then he let it go. And what we see is that ultimately it wasn't too big for God. He stepped out in faith. He gave the request. He asked for a, a really, really tall order. And then look at verse 8. The very end. He stepped out, he took risk, he was bold, he was courageous, he was committed. And, and the king granted me what I asked. Huh. What? what? He did it. Because I was really persuasive. And I was so smart, I was so wise, and I buttered it up well, and I just said it right the right way. I mean, I, I, I closed the deal here. I, I, I showed him my strength, I, I gave him the plan, I, I made it all make sense. Uh, I brought in some people with me that, that are really close and big influencers with him. Now, that's not what he says, and that's not why it happened. Why did it happen? For the good hand of my God was upon me. He stepped out and look at what God did. And I want to tell you something. You and I can as well. If we'll step out in faith and commitment and risk, and guess what? The good hand of our God will be with us. It doesn't have to make sense. In fact, the more sense it makes, the less faith it takes. In the days of the Blitz, the German Nazis invasion of Britain, there was a family that was in a building that had been bombed. 
Dad grabbed his child, ran out of the building, and the bombing was continuing, so he found a shell hole, and he ran to that shell hole, jumped in it, turned around to have his son then jump into his arms, but when the son came to the edge of the shell hole, he couldn't see his dad. Lost him in the darkness. And father began hollering, hollering, jump, I'll catch you, jump, I'll catch you, hurry up. And the kid in terror and in tears, but I can't see you. And dad said, just jump because I can see you. To accomplish what God wants, to follow his will and his way, you and I have to be willing to trust him and to step out in faith in courage, in commitment, and be willing to take risks. And if we think that we're going to be able to change this city and reach this city with the gospel of Jesus Christ and make a massive eternal impact without risk, without change, without trusting him and being bold, we'll never see it. Because it's way too big for us. And it's way too big for where we are. But it is not too big for him. Let's pray.